Hi, I'm Daniel Benjamin. I am the president of the American Academy in Berlin. And uh, I'm delighted to welcome you to this, uh, this semester's second Daimler Foreign Policy Forum, uh, which is made possible through the generous support of the Daimler Fund. Um, I am uh, glad to say this is our most uh, truly global ever virtual event yet. I am joining you from uh, Vermont, uh, where my family still lives. And uh, our speaker today, Professor Lynn Vavrick, is joining us from uh, Los Angeles, where it is still early in the day. And um, I'm really delighted that Lynn Vavrick is uh, with us today because she's someone who I wanted to uh, get into an event and perhaps get to Berlin uh, from the moment that I arrived just a couple of months ago. Uh, Lynn Vavrick is the Marvin Hoffenberg Professor of American Politics and Public Policy at the University of California at Los Angeles, otherwise known as UCLA. She is a contributing columnist uh, to The Upshot uh, at the New York Times, a column that uh, I think has made lots of intelligent people an awful lot smarter about how politics works. Um, she is a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. She has been at UCLA for uh, roughly 20 years and before that taught at Dartmouth College. She is uh, the author of Identity Crisis, which um, uh, is, uh, I would say, the uh, favorite book of most political scientists, uh, some of whom will uh, really rave about it. Uh, it is <laughs> their favorite book about the uh, 2016 presidential campaign. And the subtitle is The 2016 Presidential Campaign and the Battle for the Meaning of America. The Washington Post uh, book review entitled it The Most Ominous Book of 2018. Uh, she, uh, she was the co-author of The Identity Crisis. She is uh, the author of, uh, or co-author of five other books. And uh, today she is going to uh, discuss with us how the pandemic has changed the US presidential election, who voters will hold accountable, and uh, what kind of changes we might expect in America uh, after an election in which the COVID pandemic has been uh, the central issue. Um, just uh, by way of telling you what's going to happen, I'm gonna turn the screen over to uh, Lynn momentarily. She'll speak for about 30 minutes. She has all kinds of slides, which uh, um, she will uh, post on the screen. After that, she and I will speak for a while. And after that, uh, I hope that you will uh, please send in your questions, send them in through the Q&A function. Uh, you can start as soon as you want and uh, I will get to them uh, as fast as I can. Do not use um, uh, the hand raising function because you will be hand raising uh, in oblivion because we're not using that function. So uh, with that, let me once again, uh, welcome Professor Vavrick and uh, it's a pleasure to have you here and I love your vote t-shirt. Um, yes, vote. <laughs> although many of your uh, viewers are uh, not in countries where they can uh, vote right now or don't have the right citizenship to vote in the American election. I know everyone wants to, so uh, I'm turning it over to you uh, with that sentiment. Thanks everyone for, for coming out today to talk a little bit about COVID and the American presidential election. Um, I am going to try to do um, a couple of things in the next, uh, you know, 25 minutes or so. Um, we're going to talk basically about this election in three ways. The first thing we're going to do is talk about some big things, some things that affect presidential elections almost all the time and understand the way they're shaping this presidential election. Then we'll talk about some things that I call swing things. So things that produce changes election to election and how they're affecting 2020. And then at the end, we'll kind of take a broad view and say, what do the big things and the swing things portend for uh, 2020? So that's where we're headed. Lots of data that I'm going to talk about today is coming from a project that I am deeply involved in at the moment called Nationscape. Um, the Democracy Fund UCLA Nationscape project is interviewing 6,250 people a week, every week. We started in July of 2019, and we will go until Inauguration Day. So we will have over 500,000 interviews, roughly 1,000 in every congressional district in the United States when we're done. 
If you're interested in these data and seeing what we're tracking and looking at maps of how things play out across the country in states and congressional districts and over time and for suburban women and young people, if you want to play around with our data, uh, you can do that on the USA Today website. We have a partnership with them for a data visualization. And if you just Google Nationscape Insights USA Today, you will find that website and you can uh, play around with all of our data. Okay, so we'll start with um, just the, the types of things I'm going to talk about, the big things and the swing things. Big things, party identification. So we're going to talk about what role that plays and why it's important. We'll talk about the national context. That's going to specifically be the state of the nation's economy. And then we'll talk about some things that help to swing elections, uh, the candidates, the choices the candidates make, and how they interact with the national context. Okay, so we'll start with party identification, one of the big things. And the takeaway here is party identification is strong and stable. So this is data from our Nationscape project on just what's the distribution of party identification in the United States this year. And you can see it's, it looks roughly evenly split. So how, how is that a factor? But this 36% number for independence, when we push those people, and we say, okay, but do you lean toward one or the other party? Do you have a tendency? A lot of them break off. And so really, after we follow up, we get this distribution of party identification. So there are not a lot of people who are in the middle, who don't have a party identification. Okay, so why is that important? Because that party identification is a very strong predictor of how people vote. So in 2016, roughly 90% of people who identified as Republicans voted for Donald Trump and 89% of people who identified as Democrats voted for Hillary Clinton. So the fact that there aren't very many people without one of these party IDs means that there aren't very many people who are up for grabs, so to speak. So let's take a look at some of those transitions, some of the way people move off of their party identification. What I'm showing you here is data from 2012 to 2016. So we've interviewed the same people over time. And I've got 5,710 people in this, in this table. And I'm showing you here their vote in the rows in 2012 and in the columns, their vote in 2016. And the way to read this is the percentage is sum across the rows. So you want to say conditional on voting for Mitt Romney in 2012. How many Mitt Romney voters voted for Donald Trump in 2016? And you can see about 94%, roughly 6% peeling off to vote for Hillary Clinton. So Romney Clinton voters from 12 to 16. But when you look down here, conditional on voting for Barack Obama in 2012, how many of them voted for Hillary Clinton? About 90%. So she's losing more Obama voters than Trump lost Romney voters. Almost 10% of Obama voters peeling off in 2016 to vote for Donald Trump. Now, when we look specifically among white non-college educated voters, and you read this, this table the same way, you can see this number really jumps out. So white non-college educated voters, Romney to Trump, 96% consistency. Only about 4% of white non-college educated voters are peeling off to vote for Clinton in 2016. But White non-college educated voters who voted for Obama in 2012, almost a quarter of them peel off to vote for Donald Trump in 2016. So this is a big loss for Clinton in 2016. So let's look at how those transitions are shaping up. So this is, this is about the stability of party identification. These numbers, 94%, 90%, 96%. This one, not so stable. Okay, but in general, party is a very stable predictor of vote, but where are the losses? Okay, in 2016 to 2020, and this is slightly different because I don't have the same people, I'm asking people who they voted for in 2016. So it's not quite the same table, but it's serving the same purpose. 
So conditional on telling me that you voted for Donald Trump in 2016, how many are planning on sticking with Trump in 2020? 86%, 7% peeling off for Biden. Some people still out here in the unsure category. Conditional on saying you voted for Clinton in 2016, sticking with Biden, 90%. So the Democrats are holding on to more voters than the Republicans in the 16 to 20 transition. And then if we look at the white non-college educated voters, you can see that this is the number that was very big in the 2012 to 16 transition. Now those people have already sorted. They're living up here in the Trump row, okay? And they're, they're not really going back to Biden, but the, the sort of the bleed or the loss of white non-college educated voters um, is not as severe in the 16 to 20 transition as it was in 12 to 16. Okay, so that's a little bit of the context of party identification going into 2020 and how much these candidates, Trump and Biden, are holding on to their support from previous elections. And that 86% number um, for Trump is, is worrying to him, I am sure. That is lower than they would like it to be. Okay, big thing number two, national context, state of the nation's economy. What I'm showing you here on the horizontal axis is growth rate in domestic product for the first six months of every election year. The plotting symbols here are marking the presidential elections. And on the y-axis, the vertical axis here, I've got the incumbent party's share of the two-party vote in these elections. And I've drawn a trend line. And you can see a few things. The trend line sloping up. What does that tell us? That, tell us, that tells us that incumbent parties in growing economies do better, right? And typically win elections. So as GDP growth goes up, the incumbent party does better. Incumbent parties in shrinking economies typically lose elections. So the economy is a structuring factor of these presidential election outcomes at the aggregate level, I'm not saying anything about what's happening in individual voters' uh, minds or in their recipe for vote, but just at the aggregate level, which party's winning and losing, what's the economy doing? Now, you'll also notice that there's a lot of dispersion around this line, there's a lot of noise. Um, and you can have a really good time talking about these interesting uh, cases that are far away from the line. But here's a case I want to focus on. 2016, this election year that was so different in so many ways, right on the line. So this isn't, it's not the case that because Donald Trump is an unusual candidate, the state of the nation's economy is not having the same robust uh, structuring factor. Um, it, it did in 2016. Um, it did for Barack Obama in 2012, which you can see right here. So the economy is playing a role. Okay, so what else happens that is um, sort of stable and predictable in presidential elections in the United States? Well, one of the things is the way elections swing. And so sometimes that can be something that is stable and uniform. And sometimes it can be something that is really different uh, and not uniform. I'm showing you here one of the transitions that is relatively uniform. And by uniform, I mean that state by state, the change in the Democratic vote share, so here I'm doing Obama's two-party vote margin in 08 and his two-party margin in 12. So here he it's the same candidate, Barack Obama in both years. State by state, you can see most of the changes drop below this 45 degree line. If all of the state plotting symbols were on the 45 degree line, that would mean in a state that was evenly fought in 08, it was evenly fought in 12, right? If you won by 20 points in 08, you won by 20 points in 12. That would be if all the dots were on a line. The fact that almost all of the plotting symbols are below the line tells you that in 2012, the shine is coming off the Obama candidacy a little bit. They all are moving the same way. Um, 
not not so much uh you know i think i think that's supposed to be alaska i'm not sure if i've got the right abbreviation there um but you can uh remember that sarah palin from alaska was a candidate in 08. okay so a uniform shift away from obama from 8 to 12. all right and and also the economy is implicated here in 08 we had um, a big economic shock. And so Obama as the out party candidate is coming in with a bigger margin. In 12, the economy is growing, but growing slowly. Okay, so let's look at 2016. So here now, Obama two party margin in 2012 and Clinton two party margin in 2016. And you can see here that the plotting symbols are not all on the same sign, side of the hashed 45 degree line. Some states, Texas, California, Arizona, Clinton does better than Barack Obama did in 2012. But in other states, Ohio, Iowa, she's doing much worse. And so all the states are not moving in the same way from 12 to 16, the way they did from eight to 12. Okay, but now let's look at what, so what's going on in 2020, the transitions from 16 to 20, are they like the initial eight to 12 or are they like last time where people in states were voting differently? So I've taken, obviously we don't have the election outcome. So I've used my nationscape data uh, to look at the two party vote margin state by state. So this is survey data, it's not the same thing. Again, we don't have that election outcome yet so in 15 days, I'll be able to make that previous table and draw this graph with the actual election outcomes. But right now I'm using survey data. And you can see that this looks really different. This is a uniform swing up toward Biden in 2020 and away from Donald Trump. OK, so and almost all states and, you know, the magnitudes are somewhat different but um, everybody is moving toward the Democrats. Okay, so that's another piece of evidence. This taken along with the way Biden is holding on to those Clinton voters in the transition tables, the way the white non-college educated voters are not continuing to peel away from the Democratic Party in uh, great magnitude. Those things taken together are gonna help us make an argument for what we think is happening in this 2020 presidential election. Okay, so now let's get to the last part, things that really uh, help change election outcomes, who the candidates are and how they frame the election choice. All candidates come with constraints. They are, uh, it matters who the parties nominate. So we have here in 2020, a contest that has shaped up to be about one candidate, Joe Biden, talking a lot about a performance evaluation of a sitting incumbent president on the economy and COVID. And so if you think about how the economy is structuring this election, obviously there are limits to that linear relationship I showed you. 2020 would be off of that chart. I couldn't even put it on that graph. So who knows what we're going to have to do to draw that picture after 2020. Um, but the fact is that Donald Trump is an incumbent party president in an economy that is shrinking. And yes, that's because of a crisis and a crisis that he could not foresee, but Joe Biden is rightly blaming the incumbent party for the current economic situation and tying COVID into that, the handling of COVID. So based on historical presidential elections since the New Deal, but even before that, Biden is saying, I'm taking a lesson from the past and I'm saying that incumbent parties and shrinking economies typically lose and I'm gonna tie Trump to this economy. Trump then has to refocus the election off of the economy and onto something else. If the election is about the economy and COVID, history tells us he should be losing. John McCain said in 08, when everybody was talking about the global financial crisis, which was another thing that happened, sort of lead the, it was leading to it, but the crisis happened during the campaign. So everyone's talking about it. And John McCain said, if we're talking about the economy, we're losing. We have to talk about something else. And that is exactly what should be happening in the Trump campaign. They should be saying, if we're talking about the economy and COVID, we're losing. So we have a message coming out of the Trump campaign about safety and crime and what's going on in the suburbs and how we're protecting people's quote unquote way of life. 
Okay, so this is an issue that Trump is trying to make more important to people in 2020 than the economy and COVID. Now he gets a little help with this in 2020. So when we think about which of these two frames is gaining traction, um, we're gonna, both things, COVID and crime and safety are things that are becoming contemporary issues during the election year. So the police killing of George Floyd on Memorial Day, Day weekend in the United States is what is going to give some traction to Trump's message on crime and safety and what's happening in suburbia. Uh, the suburbs are where most Americans live, not just white Americans, Americans of all races. And so that focus on the suburbs um, it has a couple of reasons, but one of them is that that's a lot of people live there. And so appealing to people in suburbs is a way to appeal to a large chunk of voters. Okay, but we're going to start with COVID and Biden. How has that reshaped the election? First thing right off the bat, as I'm sure everybody appreciates, COVID has affected nearly everyone's life. So we've been asking questions about COVID and health um, and the pandemic since March. And I'm just showing you here across a couple of different things, canceling travel, staying home, stopping seeing family and washing your hands more often, blue Democrats, red Republicans, yellow independents. How many Americans say that they have done these things? And I've got them ordered for you by their impact. Almost everyone is washing their hands more than they used to. Most people 75% of Republicans, 85% of Democrats have stopped visiting family. Staying home, again, just large shares of the American population, canceling travel, staying home. So the, 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 the pandemic has changed everyone's day-to-day -day life. Now, one thing that's interesting about how these attitudes have shaped up is that they are tied in the beginning Democrats, Republicans, and independents, I'm going to show you right over here, these lines for party are roughly the same. What I'm showing you is approval of state level mitigation factors for the virus. So are you concerned, but then do you approve of canceling large gatherings? Do you approve of restricting non-essential travel, of closing schools and universities? And in the beginning, in March and April, there's not very much separation by party. As we move across time and politicians begin to deliver messages, you can see separation on party across all of these things and quite big gaps. 50% of Republicans approve of closing schools and universities, almost 80% of Democrats. Now I want you to compare the separation by party to what's going on over here in this second column of plots in which I've broken out the states that people live in by whether they were early peak states, places like New York, or later peak states, places like the Midwest or the South, or low rate states, states that really never had um, a significant number of COVID cases. And if infection rates, if risk of contracting the virus were affecting people's concern levels or attitudes about mitigation strategies, you would see these lines changing over time as the infection rates were changing, peaking early, peaking late, or never peaking. And what you can see is that these lines are pretty much all on top of each other. There's no variation like there is for party. So differences in people's attitudes about how to mitigate against the virus and how concerned they are, are not tied to the risk that is presented by where they live, but are tied to their political party identification and the messages that they're being delivered by their political leaders. Trump saying about the governor of Michigan, don't let her close down the state, the state, you know, take Michigan back, Michigan voters and uh, state governors urging their citizens to stay home to wear masks uh, and closing down bars and businesses and gyms, which in California, for example, uh, in my county still remain closed. Okay, so 
somewhat strangely, another thing that hasn't moved at all is Americans' views on health care. So in the middle of a global pandemic, the largest health crisis uh, that the country has faced in anyone's lifetime, attitudes about whether the government should provide health insurance to everyone, whether we should abolish private insurance, whether we should enact a policy proposal called Medicare for all, or subsidize health insurance for low income people. These lines could not be any flatter over this period from July of 19 to August of 2020. My thought is that this is because these attitudes, unlike those attitudes on virus mitigation and concern about COVID have not been tied to the virus. They are politicized. You can see the difference there. Um, support and oppose that's going to largely be tied to party. But health care has not been discussed by partisan elites as a part of COVID. The discussion has been about how to protect yourself, how to stay safe, and about the policies to help us do that, not about how we're getting health care. Interestingly, the Supreme Court nomination that has just been made has been more about the provision of health care than the discussion of the global pandemic. So we'll see if that's the thing, once I have more data, that makes some of these things start to change. OK, so how is this shaping up for Joe Biden? Well, he um, what I'm showing you here is state by state. The, the, um, the blue dots are for Biden. The red dots are for Trump. And I'm asking people, how much does this candidate care about people with COVID? And so you can see over time that, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, not over time, over states, people think that Joe Biden cares more about people with COVID than Donald Trump almost universally. There are a few states over here where uh, maybe it's a, it's a bit of a mix, um, but here's Ohio, here's Iowa, here's Pennsylvania, Arizona, Florida. Even in these battleground states where the election really is being contested, people think Biden cares more about people with COVID than Trump. And the same thing for caring about people who have lost their jobs because of COVID. Um, and again, almost universally, not as much so, but almost universally, Biden cares more. There are some places that are uh, clearly Trump cares more about this. But again, the battleground states, Arizona, Wisconsin, Florida, Pennsylvania, Ohio is no difference here in Ohio between Trump and Biden. But for these other states, large differences in the battleground. Joe Biden cares more about people who have lost jobs. Now, Joe Biden is the is the empathizer in chief. I, I totally get that. And we've asked this about a number of different questions. And I could show you some other one. Does he does he care about people like me? Does he care about the rich? Does he care about the poor? It is not the case that people think Joe Biden cares about everyone more than Donald Trump cares. Um, these are specific things related to COVID. OK, so what about Trump's uh, efforts here to refocus the election off of COVID, off of the economy, and onto uh, crime and safety, and particularly the suburbs. Well, over, over the weekend, um, he said, suburban women, will you please like me? Please, please. And then he said, I made your, I made your suburbs safe. So he is um, now really focusing, he's back to focusing on this in his post-COVID diagnosis period. And um, really essentially begging suburban women to come to him. So a couple of things for Trump make this difficult. Uh, the first is I'm showing you here again, state by state, favorability of the police. So the, the darker orange dots are favorability of the police before the police killing of George Floyd. So before Memorial Day weekend of 2020, and then the lighter orange dots are favorability of police after. By some stroke of luck, we put on this survey in July of 2019, favorability ratings of police. So we have a lot of data on this before Memorial Day weekend of 2020 and after. You can see almost universally, again, in every state in the country, ratings of police officers went down after the killing of George Floyd. So people like police less after um, that event. 
we can break that out now for groups of people. And I'm showing you here the dark orange line. Uh, this right here, this hash line is Memorial Day weekend when George Floyd is killed. And suburban women, you can see the drop there uh, in favorability of police, uh, which is echoed by other groups, urban women, um, this mix of urban and suburban is this light orange line. That's Those are basically suburbs that have a higher density level. They're closer to urban centers. Everybody, for every group, Democrats, Republicans, independents, everybody's ratings of police officers go down. Now, you'll also notice this, this sort of bounce back, very typical in public opinion. When attitudes change quickly, they almost always sort of return to their pre-shock level. Things haven't returned, but they have come back a little bit. But even still today, people's ratings of police officers are lower than they were before the killing of George Floyd. So is this message of sending law enforcement into communities to protect communities having any traction for Donald Trump? This is a bit of a tough argument because people's ratings of law enforcement have gone down. And his argument is, I'm going to send law enforcement in to protect you. So how is that shaping up? So I've made this uh, graph to show you. This is two-party vote for Joe Biden by geography and gender. So urban women, Biden's biggest fan group. The urban suburban women, those dense suburbs, um, the next uh, biggest fan group. Here's suburban women, still above 50%. Then the only other group of women, rural women down here. But mostly you'll notice that the women are here and the men with the exception of rural women are here. So to say that this election is really something special about suburban women, I don't think is, Trump doesn't have a suburban woman problem. He has a woman problem. Um, Donald Trump is struggling to get the votes of women whether they live in uh, the suburbs or dense suburbs or urban areas. Okay, so here's favorability. Uh, oh, sorry, let's go back. Same basic pattern, uh, favorability of Trump now. So you can see the men are up here and the women, mostly with the exception of the rural women, which are largely Republican and largely white, uh, women are down here. So Trump is struggling with women as a group, not just with suburban women. Okay, so thinking about how this, why isn't he able to get this traction that he was able to get by playing on these identity inflected issues, like the chaotic protesting unruly mob is coming to your suburb. That's a racially inflected issue, just like immigration was, or terrorism was in 2016. Well, let's take a look at the pickups that Joe Biden has made, um, again, in the transition from 2016 to 2020. So I'm showing you here two measures on the horizontal axis of people's um, levels of racial angst or racial animosity. One of them is a series of questions, a scale, um, that asks people about whether discrimination against Black Americans is largely because of a lack of effort or because of discrimination that is historic. So people who are more likely to have high levels of racial animosity, um, they have not moved to Joe Biden, but people ha who have lower levels of racial angst have moved toward Biden um, in a pretty profound way in some areas, uh, if in, at some levels. And over here on the horizontal axis is just whether you think there is a high or low level of, oops, of, discrimin of discrimination against white people in America. So if you think white people are discriminated against at a high level, you have not moved toward Joe Biden. But if you think there are low to middling levels of discrimination against white people in America, you're moving, those groups have moved toward Biden. And so this is just some bit of evidence that these racially inflected ideas are still at play 
in 2020, but not in the same work in the same way that they were in 2016. So where does this leave us as we think about the broad picture and the 2020 election? So partisans are more stable than they were in 2016. Um, that is structuring this race so that there are fewer undecided voters and there are fewer people, um, particularly those white non-college educated voters peeling off from the Democrat to the Republican. The economy is helping the Democrats. That is the same as it was in 2016. Biden has focused on it and not moved off of it. One of the things that has impressed me about the Biden campaign is their, rel their relentless focus on the economy and COVID. They have not moved off of that message. And so they are helping to tie this election to those features. And then finally, Trump's COVID diagnosis is for me a pivotal moment in the way the last three weeks of this election is, is playing out. It becomes very hard for him to change the focus of the 2020 election off of COVID and off of the economy. Those are tied together when he gets diagnosed with COVID and his event becomes a super spreader event and lots of people on his campaign staff are diagnosed with COVID. So that, that is a magnet that is going to tie the frame of this election to COVID, which is bad uh, for the Trump campaign. So question number one, the, 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 the uh, message of your presentation is that COVID and uh, the consequent economic collapse uh, have been the game changers. And there's uh, an awful lot of reason to uh, believe that. Um, on the other hand, um, you know, 2018, the congressional election was extraordinary uh, in terms of talking about anti-Republican, anti-Trump mobilization in the country. Is there any way to uh, try to imagine this election without COVID and uh, to imagine what might be going on if, uh, in fact, um, the economy were still humming and uh, we hadn't lost uh, 220,000 people and had 8 million cases of this bug? Yeah, I think about this all the time. What's that counterfactual world look like without COVID? And I remember in January and February of this year when the Democratic nominating contest was happening and there was lots of news coverage about these rallies. And Trump said, well, I'm going to kick my campaign off too. Um, and it, you know, it's sort of a good thing for us that we get to observe what his pre-COVID campaign was going to look like. So he gives us this counterfactual observation on what he was going to talk about. Um, because he wants in on the action in January and February. So he doesn't have a contested primary, um, but he's like, I'm kicking off my general election campaign. So he goes to Florida and he delivers uh, a pair of speeches and he literally comes out and he says to the cry, I know, I know what you're thinking. You don't like me very much, but you're gonna vote for me anyway because I delivered you this booming economy. And I remember being shocked that that was his message. He went out, kicked off his general election campaign, focusing on the economy. And I thought to myself, wow, like he's seen the graph. Um, I don't think he's seen the graph. I think he's just got good instincts and he knows that people like growing economies and they have one. And he said, I'm gonna claim credit for that. So his instincts are, are usually very good at things like this. He's very good at reading the room. And I thought, wow, he's really going to do that. And that is how he wins in 2020. And I think without COVID, um, I think that, you know, a lot of things would have been different, including how much protesting there was. I, I, I think that that in some way is also the fact that a lot of people had time. Nobody had to take time off from work to go take to the streets because we were all working from home. Um, and so I think that amplified that moment. So I think a lot of things would have been a little bit different. Um, and I think it probably would have been much more of a contest mm -hmm. um, than, it, than it has turned out to be. Uh, another question. Um, so your um, 
uh, your presentation focused appropriately on the gender gap, which is staggeringly large now. And uh, the extent to which those women who had support, I mean, it was staggeringly large in the last election in historical uh, comparison. Um, and it's even bigger now. Um, but what are the other uh, groups that have really moved out of the Trump column? Um, it's interesting. I mean, it's interesting in its own right, but it's also kind of interesting, it seems to me, in terms of all the discussions we have about partisanship in, in our country. So um, what can you tell us about that? The other group that has moved significantly away from Donald Trump in the transition from 16 to 20 are senior citizens or older people. Um, and that's been a big shift. And, and that is probably less tied to shifting party than the gender transition is. Um, so men have been moving away from the Democratic Party, particularly white men, for several election cycles. That's a long-term trend. Women moving into the Democratic Party across all racial groups, that's a long-term trend. Uh, but this senior citizen moment with Trump uh, is probably driven by Trump. And you mean, and, and by his, his failure regarding COVID? Well, it predates COVID. Um, so it isn't, it, senior citizens had moved away from Trump before COVID. Hmm. Um, and, and I think the story there, there's a lot of work to be done there um, about exactly what's, what's going on. Guesses? You're not gonna guess what it's, uh, what's driving that? Um, I, I, I don't have any good guesses. Um, I don't have any good guesses. You did a, a really fascinating uh, column in the New York Times on actually mapping how much of a difference um, COVID casualties, COVID, I think primarily deaths, but maybe it's cases. Deaths, yeah, it's in, deaths. Uh, one's immediate surroundings in one's county, for example, were affecting uh, uh, the, uh, the polls. Can you just rehearse that argument for us? Yeah, so in keeping with the, the same kind of um, relationship that I showed you in this presentation about whether the cases in your state affects your preference for mitigation strategies or your concern about the virus, we also wanted to know um, were COVID deaths affecting votes for Donald Trump or other politicians. Um, and so we did this at the county level and uh, state level, county level. We also did it at the media market level. The results are pretty, pretty much the same across all those levels. But if you think about the county level, um, COVID deaths, an increasing number of deaths in the county are costing Donald Trump votes. So we've got polling data that we tie to uh, the county and we know the death rate in the county and we know how those things are changing within county and we know how they're changing at any moment in time, how they're different across county. So we use the, the both of those things as leverage to identify this effect. The variation at any moment in time across counties in death rate and then in one particular county, the changes in death rates over time. And what you can see is that as the death rates increase, uh, votes for Republicans at the presidential, Senate, and um, House level go down. So COVID is bad for the Republican Party. Um, and didn't have to be, in my view. It didn't have to be. Right. So um, I'm curious, because right now, uh, the states that are being most affected by the virus are deep red states. And um, maybe there's too much of a time lag for that to show up in your data, but are you seeing movement in uh, North Dakota, in South Dakota, in Wyoming, all these other places that are really being hit hard now, Nebraska? So we, um, we have looked at counties on average, so across all counties. 
Um, I do, I do recall that we had this idea um, and we thought that there would be differences by whether the county went Democrat or Republican, for example, in the 2016 election. My recollection is we looked for those kinds of differences and didn't find any. Um, the average effects seem to be about the same um, across counties. Fascinating. Let's go back to the issue of uh, the gender gap. Uh, have you um, and your colleagues uh, disaggregated in any way what it is uh, that is driving women away from Donald Trump? Um, how much of it is about, you know, his own um, remarks about women and the, the many news stories about his treatment of women? How much of it is about uh, you know, prudential thinking on the basis of, uh, by women about, you know, the health of their families. Um, have you been able to disentangle any of that or is it all the above? Well, it's all of the above for sure. Um, but I'll remember that women have been moving away from the Republican party for several cycles. So this isn't just a story about Donald Trump. Um, it's a story about women becoming more democratic. Um, and, I don't think that's tied specifically to candidates. I think that's about the kind of world they wanna live in. So some of that is policy related and some of it is happening over a long arc. But then there is the Trump factor. So this is a, in, a, in a sense, the it's all of the above answer. Um, there, is, there is the Trump factor. Now he is the same guy he was in 2016. Um, you know, everybody heard all of the things that he said about women in those Hillary Clinton ads in 2016. And it, you know, it, this isn't news to anyone. It's, it should be baked into the evaluation. Um, you know, a lot of things are possible that COVID exacerbates the fact that he, he's just unempathetic. It could be standing next to Joe Biden exacerbates the effect that he's not empathetic at all and very self-interested. Um, I, I think we'll have, once we have an election outcome, we'll be able to dig into all of this and really figure out if there was anything particular about women in 2020 that looks different from 2016. Um, I haven't done that work yet, but um, I think that that will tell us some things. I'm skeptical. I think most of it is probably this long-term shift. So you wrote a really, uh, co-wrote a fab fabulous book about 2016. And um, you'll correct my phrasing, but this, the story of 2016 in your book, Identity Crisis, was that it wasn't economic anxiety, it was racial anxiety, if I can put it that bluntly. That it was uh, that the outcome of the election um, and the fact that Trump was, uh, you know, really, really close, even though he lost by 2 million uh, votes in the in the popular vote, but that what Trump uh, did was really tap reservoirs of white anxiety about becoming uh, a minority within the United States, um, which is what is happening. And also, I think the sense uh, that minorities were getting a bigger slice of the benefits pie from the federal government, which has been, you know, a subject of a lot of reporting, at least that perception. So how does that, what's the afterlife of that story in 2020? Um, I think that the way, I, I, I will only reframe the summary of the 2016 book in one small way. Okay. which is that I, I like to think of it as um, these identity inflected ideas are like an umbrella that hangs over the 2016 election. And every raindrop that comes off of the umbrella that drops off of it is affected by the umbrella. So when he talks about the economy, which he does, he inflects it with identity. So he says, not just, are you, you're gonna lose your job, he says, you're gonna lose your job to an undocumented immigrant, right? He, he gets that identity part of it in there. And in that way, he makes identity a part of every issue that anyone is talking about in 2016. Trade, foreign policy, terrorism, immigration, the economy. So it's not necessarily that those issues aren't playing a role, 
is that even if they are playing a role, they're playing a role through the lens of identity. We say in the book that those issues get refracted through identity ideas. Okay, so how's that playing out in 2020? Or I like how you said, it, what's the afterlife of that idea? Well, Trump's trying really hard to make 2020 also refract through identity with his focus on what's happening in the suburbs and keeping the mob out of the suburbs, um, taking back our states. You know, these are all ideas that are refracted through um, race. And in this case, it's not about undocumented immigrants, but it's about Black Americans and civil rights for Black Americans, for the most part. Um, and he's, I think, still trying very hard to do that. Um, he's not having as much success because I would say um, the context of this election is very different than 2016. In this case, he is the incumbent. So he is accountable for the state of the nation's economy. In 2016, he was the challenging party. Okay, the economy was still not on his side. It's not on his side in either election, but he's in a very different position. In 16, the economy is not on his side because he's a challenger and the economy is slowly growing. So he's got to make that election not about the economy because if it is, Clinton's going to win. In 2020, the economy is not on his side, but he is to blame for the decline. That's a tougher position to be in. And COVID makes it really, really hard to shift the focus off of that. So in some ways, he's in the same position. And he's trying to do the same thing, but he's playing in a different stadium, if you will, or his, he's performing the same play on a different stage. I see. Well, it does... Um raise the longer term question of what happens to the Republican Party as it becomes the party of white males and especially uh, white males without, without college degrees. And what does that do to our democracy? If you have any off the top of your head uh, reactions to that, I'd be fascinated. Otherwise we can, we can turn to some of the questions here, but what do you think of that? Well, I definitely wanna to get to people's questions. So I'll try to be very brief on this. Um, the question of the future of the Republican Party is one of the biggest and most interesting questions in American politics right now. Nobody knows the answer to this question. So that's thing number one. But can we think of some hooks that will help us figure out where the forks in the road might come? I think there are a couple. Um, the first is watch partisan elites. So the power of uh, political elites to shape what people, what citizens, what the mass electorate talks about, um, how they think about political choices, uh, that, that power is very strong. So say Trump loses, what will Republican elites, how will they respond? Um, there will be people who want to carry on the Trump tradition. Trump may be one of them. Um, he may, as he said over the weekend, you know, take up on some island and leave the country, but he may start a media company and still be on TV every day. He may still be doing the same exact thing he's doing now, tweeting every day, saying inflammatory things, just not as president. Uh, so, you know, maybe nothing is, is also totally about changing. Yeah, right. So, you know, <clears throat> but the question is not what, so much what he does. It's what uh, partisan elites, Republican elites do. Um, and are there people with vision? Are there political entrepreneurs in the party who will, here's, here's something to think about. There are bunches of issues in America that people agree on, Republicans and Democrats. Um, overwhelming support for universal gun background checks. Overwhelming support for a path to citizenship for dreamers. Um, things like this, that even, even on policing, Americans want to ban chokeholds. They don't want to defund police departments. So there's agreement on these things and not just like 52, 48, really lopsided agreement on these things. None of them are policy. Why? They are different. Those things are different priorities for people in the two parties. We need a set of partisan elites who will get together 
and say, let's make some progress on the things that are policy priorities in your party that everyone in the country agrees on and the things that are policy priorities in my party that everyone in the country agrees on. And it's win, win, win. I get to go home and claim credit. You get to go home and claim credit and voters get something they actually want. I think that there are partisan elites with that kind of vision and that kind of capability. It's not easy at this moment in time, but that's a way that the future of both parties looks a little bit different, um, but particularly the Republican Party. Will it happen? I don't know, but there is there is a fork in the road that leads that way. Yeah, it's a fascinating uh, scenario and having uh, seen uh, essentially so many Republicans who I suppose qualify as being in the, the, those elites, especially those in Congress, uh, time and again, God bless you, time and again, Thank you. Uh, um, shy away from that kind of move and uh, sort of in, uh, implicitly acknowledge that nothing can be done to alienate the hard right base that Trump has built. Um, has stood in the way. In other words, you know, only now are we hearing Senator Sass, uh, Senator Cornyn, and others uh, start to sing a different song. They have all followed the path of essentially doubling down on appealing to the base for the last four years. So on the one hand, your hypothesis sounds uh, really timely. On the other hand, uh, we've seen this show before. Uh, after 2012, the Republicans, you know, did a big study that said we have to appeal to minorities, we have to be more inclusive, we have to do better with women, so on and so forth. And that is not what happened. So maybe it's going to take a, a, def a bigger defeat at the polls. I don't know, or one that in which they <laughs> lose Congress as well. So, well, I, the point that I like about the the Growth and Opportunity Project report, which is the the um, the report that you're talking about. There were 17 people who ran for the Republican nomination in 2016. 16 of them were relatively in on that message. And there was one person who did not take that report seriously. And that was Donald Trump. Okay, so, but say if Trump didn't run in 2016, one of those 17 other people would have gotten the nomination. Um, and you know, we'd be talking about something very different right now. But the, the my point is that um, it isn't that the Republican Party and Republican elites threw that report out and said, no, like, we don't want to attract non-white voters. This is not who we are. In fact, it's exactly the opposite. Um, and, and we are where we are because of one candidate. Yeah, completely fascinating. So uh, let me start um, taking from the Q&A. And um, one of the questions uh, that several different uh, viewers have brought up is um, in, sort of on the tip of everyone's tongue and, um, and a matter of concern for lots and lots of people. And that is, uh, why should we believe polls, basically? <laughs> um, so lots of people, you know, continues to be a debate. Were we misled in um, 2016? Uh, what do the polls tell you? How confident are you uh, about the outcome right now? Okay, so I want people to think about polls in 2016 and in general and presidential elections in two ways. So the first is, since the, the beginning of, of nationwide polling in the 1950s, if we move across time, there's a great graph of this on the Pew website. You move across time. Um, polling today is much more accurate than it has been at any point in time. In 2016, the average miss of nationwide polls was about a point and a third. So the polls were not wrong in 2016. What, every, what makes people think they were so wrong, Hillary Clinton, they predicted Hillary Clinton was gonna win the popular vote and Hillary Clinton won the popular vote by almost the exact margin that the polls predicted she would. The complication is that the way those votes were distributed, particularly across three states, Michigan, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, 77,000 votes across those three states swung the election. 
Okay, that that's a tough nut to crack. You're 77,000 votes in three states. So nationwide polling was never broken. Wasn't broken in 2016, isn't broken now. The state polls, okay, there we, this is the second part of how I want you to think about it. The state polls, we can talk about some things that have, that we learned from 2016. So you take a place like Michigan. First of all, there wasn't a lot of polling in those places. Nobody anticipated them being so close. So, you know, that's a problem. Why not? Um, you might think to yourself, if I were running for president and I saw Iowa polls, flipping so much from 2012 to 2016, would I think that states that were adjacent to Iowa, counties in states adjacent to Iowa might be a concern for me? And you might think, yes, I might go in there and do some polling, but it isn't what happened in 2016. So there wasn't a lot of polling in Wisconsin, in Michigan. Um, and the, the polls that people were doing we're done the way we've always done state polling. You try to get balance on targets that you know. So you want to have the right amount of men and women and old people and young people and Democrats and Republicans. And you get that balance from every part of the state. But what starts to happen is based, that these relationships start, start to differ based on education. So a Republican in one part of Michigan looks really different than a Republican in another part of Michigan, let's say, based on uh, geography, but also tied to education and geography. So that you can't just, a Republican isn't a Republican. You've got to get a certain number of Republicans from this geography and that geography to get the mix exactly right. You can't get all your Republicans from one part of the state. That is something that people hadn't appreciated as much uh, until 2016. And now pollsters are accounting for that education uh, divide in lots of different ways. So I think they've learned a lot. Um, and I think that uh, the, my takeaway to answer the last part of the question about what do the polls tell me about 2020, they tell me that 2020 is not 2016. So it is the case that Hillary Clinton was ahead in 2016, but she was not uniformly ahead. The way I think about this is I like to look like an accordion. There were times when she was ahead and then the race would close and then it would open back up again and then it would close and it would open. It was like an accordion. And I always think about that by saying the race in 2016 wanted to be close. Remember where it is on that economic prediction line, it's right on the line and it's really close to 50-50 because the economic growth was not that much. The race wants to be close, but Trump won't let it. He is out there in 2016 saying inflammatory things, as we now know is he does, to win the news cycle. He wants to win the news cycle every day. So for him, all news is good news. It doesn't matter if it's, you know, he says something outrageous. He invites the women who accused Bill Clinton of uh, sexual crimes to come sit in the front row with a debate. He's making news all the time. And that keeps the gap in polling really big. But then there are these moments in 2016 where it closes when Clinton's um, scandals get in the news. So Benghazi, the email server, um, Comey, you see the polls close. That's, I think, in my view, that's where the race always wanted to be. But Trump was just out there doing these unusual things and pulling it apart. 2020 doesn't look anything like that. The gap is big. Joe Biden is ahead from the start. He's ahead the whole time. And the gap is, if anything, getting bigger. So there are really two different dynamic processes at play here. Um, even though it feels like if you just take a snippet, it might feel like it's the same thing in the polls. It's really not. So um, let's parse that a bit more. Uh, one of the extraordinary <laughs> things about uh, polling uh, has been the fact that Donald Trump, you know, when everything is aggregated and averaged, is at about 41% approval, which is where he was four years ago, despite all the ups and downs. So uh, if you are um, um, a person who's not prone to uh, accepting really sophisticated analysis like that, um, and you are a, a Biden uh, supporter, why would you not be 
you know, uh, hanging from your fingernails uh, on the roof right now. <laughs> That's a complicated way of saying that um, 41% now, he was at 41% then. Uh, why should I feel confident? I think you have to believe a lot about approval ratings to be hanging from your fingernails. Um, one of the things about presidential approval in modern times is that it is moving a lot less than it used to. This is not a Trump thing. This started with Obama's presidency. So Obama's approval rating was uh, less volatile than previous presidents, and so is Trump's. Obama underperformed, in terms of approval, underperformed his economy, so is Trump. So I don't have an answer for you as to why approval has become so sticky over these last two presidents, um, but it has. And it could be that they are both unique presidents in very different ways, but, and that, that just overrides the day-to-day -day mechanics and, and deliverables from their presidency. Um, but I don't think that it's going back to its volatile nature um, when we get the next president. Um, so I think probably it has more to do with the shifting of people into parties. Um, but uh, I don't think it's reason to think that this election is gonna come out just like 2016. There are lots of indicators um, to the contrary. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, another question, um, which uh, you know summons up the old quip uh, that uh, people, uh, people tell the truth to pollsters, but lie when they get in the uh, in the balloting uh, booth. Uh, is there a discrepancy between what people say to pollsters and how they vote? Um, there, I mean, theoretically, it's possible. I don't think that there's convincing evidence that this is what happened in 2016. Again, remember, polls predicted that Clinton would win the popular vote and she won the popular vote. They came within a point of the actual vote share she got. Um, so very accurate. Um, this is always a concern in polling, especially if you're asking about sensitive topics. You know, how many times a year do you go to the dentist? Um, you might not want to tell me the answer to that question if I'm a survey researcher. Now, one thing is, um, and let's say whether or not you're voting for Trump, for some people that's sensitive. Let's, let's just say that's a possibility. One thing we know from, from polling research is that when you take the interviewer, the other human out of the equation, so the person doesn't have to feel the social pressure to say, I go to the dentist twice a year, every year, I do. Um, when you take the other human out, by asking the question online, for example, doing an online poll, uh, you'll see people give you different answers than when the interviewer is in the room or on the phone. So that means we should see differences in the number of people saying they go to the dentist in online polls versus phone polls, the number of people saying they'll vote for Trump online and phone, and we don't see those differences for the Trump vote. You see them for the dentist, but we're not, we don't see them for Trump. So I think that there's not a lot of um, evidence that this is what's sneaking up to change the 2020 outcome. Okay. Uh, one uh, viewer asks, uh, your analysis focuses exclusively on voter transitions, um, but what about um, turnout and new voters? What, what can we say about them and what role they'll play in all this? Do they yes, just great, great trend? question. Sorry, what was the last part of your question, Dan? No, no, do, do they just follow the trends of the, of the groups that uh, you've described? Yeah, no, great. Those are actually two great questions. Um, and and, and your, uh, the viewer is exactly right. Um, I am very interested in persuasion uh, and I haven't said anything about mobilization, which is the other part of the equation for winning elections. Um, you know, it's not just that the same people turn out every year. So the composition of the electorate is the same and we're just trying to sort people. It's that the composition of the electorate changes cycle by cycle. Um, some people stay home, some people turn out and getting more of your supporters to turn out is a, is a great way um, to increase your vote. Uh, persuasion is getting changes might be better because you're taking a vote away from the other guy and get, giving yourself a vote. 
turning someone out, you're adding one vote to your side. You're not touching the other person's side, but both are very important. Um, and uh, one of the things we know about turnout is in elections that are high salience like this one, uh, more people will, tur will turn out almost by definition. So expect to see a very high turnout. Um, there probably are more Democratic votes to turn out than there are Republican votes. Republicans tend to vote in elections. So Democrats often focus more on mobilization than Republicans because they have more gains uh, to get there. So um, in a high turnout election, you might expect to see more Democratic participants than in a non-high turnout election. So that's another factor. Um, but I think both sides are trying very hard to mobilize their supporters. Now, COVID complicates that for sure. Um, another interesting uh, finding that has come out recently is about the kinds of people who will ask for mail-in ballots, much more likely to be Democrats. Um, that, that doesn't mean that there's bias. These are people who otherwise would vote, but you take a people who are gonna vote in 2020 and you offer them the chance to vote by mail or vote in person and Republicans will choose to vote in person on average and Democrats will choose to vote remote. Doesn't, it doesn't mean that offering vote by mail is increasing the Democratic vote. That is not the pattern. It's the other way around. That conditional on already being a voter, you're more likely to say, I'll mail my ballot in if you're a Democrat. So this is one of the things that's going to make election night complicated. Um, but both sides are trying really hard to mobilize. And it is important. So this, um, we have a question from uh, American Academy trustee, Ambassador John Kornblum, which is, um, uh, it seems takes the question I asked a bit earlier, uh, a little bit further. Do you draw longer term implications from your data? Um, and he cites uh, the takeover of the Republican Party by the far right, as um, Jerry Seib of the Wall Street Journal has argued, and then, you know, the, there's the issue of demographic change and almost irrational commitment to of uh, MAGA, so-called MAGA people for Trump, uh, you know, kind of um, relentless hostility to globalization. Where is it all going, Lynn? <laughs> yes, let me tell you exactly. Um, uh, this is, again, a, a million dollar question. And um, I think that the way, the best way that I have to think about this um, is to come back to the role of political elites. And, and yes, there are voters in, in the electorate in the United States with these positions. Trump didn't create them. They held these positions before. You can see it in public opinion data. But there really has not been um, a vehicle for the expression of these ideas the way there was with the Trump campaign and with the Trump presidency. So he is in, in some way um, giving these voices a, a megaphone. The question is going forward, will someone else come along to amplify those voices or to give them a vehicle to express them? Um, or you know, can we go back to people holding these attitudes and maybe even a good chunk of the Republican uh, electorate holding these attitudes, but the elites uh, not giving them an amplifier? And I think the answer to that is yes. It might not, certainly not gonna be automatic. Uh, there will be a contest. This will be a, a contestation in the Republican party. Um, and, uh, but I think that, you know, both sides are viable. And I also think maybe the return to normal side is more viable only because um, Trump is an unusual candidate. Um, there aren't very many people who are effective communicators. It's a funny thing to say about Trump because he's very different. Barack Obama is an effective communicator. Ronald Reagan is an effective communicator. Bill Clinton. Trump is too, but in a very different way. Um, he has really an uncanny ability to read the room, so to speak. Um, not because he knows public opinion data or he knows history about politics, but he knows what people are talking about and how to talk to them about that same thing in the moment. He's very good at that. 
and he's not worried. The thing that makes him better about it than most politicians, he's not worried about the long-term consequences of that uh, because his arc isn't long-term. It's win today's news cycle, get in the news today. Tomorrow's another day and I'll win that news cycle in a different way, but that's for tomorrow. Today I'm winning this news cycle. So he's able to, he has a latitude, you know, like to say things that other politicians don't have. So going forward to keep this coalition together and keep amplifying these voices, one question that I think about is, um, do you need a politician that is like that? Or, you know, can you do that with a Mike Pence? Um, I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. I think about that a lot. Um, and uh, I do think that Trump's unique characteristics have played a role in sort of coalescing this group and, and giving them um, maybe more power than they would have had under a more traditional candidate who shared their positions. So it's a little off your beaten track, but I'm curious uh -oh. because it's showing up in the news a lot. Do you um, see much of a prospect for violence after the election? Yeah. Um, again, I, I, I think that the people's tendencies, tendencies toward violence are they're not being created by Trump. They're being sort of given permission to be expressed by Trump. In, in the same way that the racial attitudes in 2016, Trump didn't create those attitudes. He gave those people permission to talk about it out loud because he was talking about it out loud. The same thing he's doing now, talking about what's gonna happen um, after the election. And so when he says it's okay to talk about these things out loud, people who hold these attitudes, who have always held these attitudes, talk about it out loud. Now, the question is whether that is in any way empowering People will always cite the pizza restaurant um, and, and, and that, you know, a person who, who meant to do violence went there um, because of what was in the news. You know, I don't, I mean, anything is possible and depending on what the outcome of the election is, um, but I think it is more likely than not um, that, that we don't see anything like that happen. Um, you know, I think if I were betting even a significant amount of money, I would bet on the side of um, that we're not talking about the violence that erupted in any significant way after, after the election. Well, I certainly hope you're, you're right. Although I have to say, finding out about plots against sitting governors um, is quite worrisome and, um, yes. you know, the fancy uh, name, I believe, for the phenomenon you were talking about, uh, at least in the realm of terrorism, is stochastic terrorism. And we've seen a remarkable amount of violence uh, that appeared to be carried out by people who felt that they had been given permission by things that had mm -hmm. been said publicly. You know, there was the pipe bomber, uh, there the the shooter in, in uh, New Zealand also claimed mm -hmm. that uh, he was acting because of, uh, in part because of signals that had been made by the president and the like. So uh, let's hope that the president is extremely cautious in his, in his statements and that uh, everyone else uh, is as well. So um, just to jump around a few other questions, one, um, one point that has been made is that there has been a significant, apparently a significant jump in Republican registrations. Uh, do you see that as being uh, a factor that hasn't been fully uh, accounted for so far? Um, I don't think so. Most of the commercial polling and media polling that is being done on the election, or not, maybe not most, but a lot of it is done off of um, what we call a list-based sample. So they're actually sampling, sampling off of voter registration lists uh, state by state. So any changes in the composition of registered voters would also be reflected in the composition of um, the people sampled. Um, now, it, you know, it depends a little bit on the targets that they're using and how they're weighting these. But um, I don't think that that uh, would worry me too much. Okay. Um, 
I think a last question because we're getting to the witching hour. Um, and I, and so I'll, I'll choose a big one. Um, everyone is concerned about polarization in America and the uh, costs that this has inflicted on our public lives and the, the stress that this has created. So one argument is that polarization comes to an end after a, after a sizable defeat, that that would, in a, in a sense, be a reset. <laughs> and that, I think, has been the message that you've been saying about party elites uh, choosing a different way after this election, if uh, it does indeed take Trump from uh, the scene. Um, so there are two, you know, there are other possibilities as well. First of all, we could have a contested election, um, which is not out of the question given the problems with uh, mail-in and absentee voting and lots of confusion, litigation, uh, all the rest. Um, and then the other thing is that, you know, there isn't really a party elite that is a sort of credible interlocutor after the election, that there's no one who really speaks for the party anymore after Trump has uh, really made it his own. And so I guess the question I have for you is, you know, is continued increased even runaway partisanship a plausible uh, outcome here? And I sure hope you're gonna say no. Oh, I'm not gonna say no, <laughs> I, but I don't think it's bad. So, so we have to pull this apart a little bit. Polarization. It, it, I try I try to never use this word because it means so many different things. So are you saying that um, the the homogeneity within the political parties, the fact that now if you tell me you're a Republican, I know pretty much where you stand on most issues. If you tell me you're a Democrat, I know where you stand on. There's homogeneity within party. That hasn't always been the case in the United States. It is the case right now. Um, is that a bad thing? I don't think that's a bad thing. That that provides an efficient shortcut and cue for voters. It makes voting easier for voters. Um, all those things would objectively be considered good things from an informational point of view. What people don't like about it and what also gets, so that's sometimes called, that's part of polarization, is that there are differences between the parties and the parties are homogenous, more homogenous than, than they have been. What's the other part of polarization, the part that people really don't like, is uh, the emotion and the vitriol that is accompanying um, the, the sort of tribal politics nature of it. Um, and so this isn't new to Trump. Again, um, people were complaining about the massive polarization during the Obama administration. Okay, so it, this has been a long time that we've had this. So another election outcome isn't going to change this automatically. Um, when I was talking about the politicians coming together and move forward, I was talking about specifically this kind of Trump era, um, you know, I, I, the, the nature of the Trump presidency, uh, the constant tweets and the us versus them, the constant us versus them nature of it. That, that underlying institutional political party differences, um, that's not changing because of an election outcome. But in my view, that's not necessarily a bad thing. Um, two parties that are different from each other seems healthy. What probably we could use less of is um, the, um, the emotion that is tied to that and the vitriol. Um, and a lot of that is, is spun up in politics becoming more like a hobby to people than, um, than a civic responsibility. Uh, and I'll, I'll recommend a colleague of mine, Eitan Hirsch at Tufts has a, has a book on this about political hobbyism and, and the deleterious consequences of that um, for, for a specific sort of health of a community. And so we, we sort of can think about ways to move away from that, but the election outcome isn't gonna do that. Um, so I'm sorry to disappoint you, but I don't think the news is all bad. Well, um, so it's completely fascinating. Um, and uh, I, I just wanna thank you. It's um, also wonderful to engage with a scholar who seems to be having the time of her life, judging by her no. about the, uh, the material, the, uh, the actual events going on. I hope I'm right about that. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's like an exciting time. We really look forward to uh, uh, 
uh, the book after the election. Uh, when, when will that be out? So um, the, the 2020 book will be uh, with John Sides again and a different third co-author, Chris Tosanovich, who is my colleague at UCLA and my partner in Nationscape. Um, and uh, it is slated for publication right before the midterm elections, so the summer of 2022. Um, and we are we are open and accepting ideas for book titles. So <laughs> put your creative hat on and, and feel free to send them our way. So this has all been recorded. We'll run through it again and see if there were any magic phrases. And okay, I just great. Want to thank uh, Professor Lynn Vavrick uh, a great deal. And and there are just so many unanswered questions. You got to come to Berlin when the when the curtain goes back up so that we can discuss them at greater length. It was a real delight having you. And uh, I want to thank all of our viewers and all those who sent in uh, those great questions. So thank you very much. It's my Good pleasure. Time. Thank you very much for having me. Take care.